Le monde est géré par un concept qui va permettre d'autres génocides. Vous n'étiez aucunement dans l'intérêt national ou personnel des grandes puissances. Et donc c'est devant vous que je vous dis que Roméo Dallaire, commandant de la force, a failli le peuple rwandais. Roland Ferris describes that 50% of the peace agreements break down after five years. And I think if you um, would, would look at the ambitions and compare those to actual results being at, it's quite meager. How do you see the peace building record? Well, I agree that it's been very disappointing. On the other hand, if you look at the figures, there actually has been greater success in establishing ceasefires and maintaining them for a while than in any previous period. I mean, by historical standards, the level of killing and wars is rather low even though we're horrified and shocked by what's happening in Syria. Having said that, I think there have been huge problems with state building and peace building that have to do with the fact that they tend to be top down, they tend to be very technical, they tend not to involve civil society, uh, they involve an enormous plethora of multinational lateral agencies and NGOs, none of whom work together. So it's very easy to write about the big problems of state building and peace building and I'd be the first to say they've not been very successful. On the other hand, I do think it was better that all this effort was put into it than none. What is the most successful example of a peace building or keeping mission? Well, I always give the example of Northern Ireland, actually, because I, even though there were lots of problems with the British role in Northern Ireland, actually the casualties were kept relatively low throughout the Troubles. And I think this was because Northern Ireland was, was part of Britain, and we couldn't afford to have violence in Britain. <laughs> And, I, you know, the argument I make is that if you're serious about humanitarian intervention, you have to treat the people where you're intervening as your citizens. So if you think of Syrians as citizens, or citizens, you're going to be much more careful about what you do than if you don't think that way. And you think about Afghanistan. I'm always shocked day after day in the newspapers the way there are many Afghan deaths but nobody gets nearly as upset as they do over the deaths of our soldiers <laughs> or some accident in America or shooting incident in America or Britain or Holland. And that attitude has to be reversed because that will change the way people behave. Will that attitude ever be reversed? It seems to me like that's a very, very sad reality of, of sort of political... Uh, life that, that politicians feel more obligations to their own constituents than, than to the people abroad. So I'm wondering if the political will and also money well, will be... I think we live in a global era and you know you studied at St Andrews and people travel around and, and I actually think, and that's something I've often said in Britain, you know we argue in Britain that we're in Afghanistan to keep British streets safe and I actually think British people would have understood Afghanistan much more if we'd said we're in Afghanistan because we have a responsibility to Afghans. And I think there is a change of attitude among people because of globalization, which actually isn't reflected in the political class. And that's one answer. The other answer is you may be completely right, but in a global interconnected world, I think then the prognosis for the future is very depressing. <laughs> So people like you and me have to argue for that change of attitude. I completely agree. <laughs> um.